There's recently been a lot of interest in something called resource misallocation um, as a potential reason for underdevelopment. And the idea is just that um, traditionally theories always just said the reason why a country is underdeveloped is because it, it lacks, I don't know, total resources. So there isn't enough capital in the economy, there isn't enough human capital, there isn't enough land that you can farm, and so on. Um, and there's this relatively new idea that um, it's not just the total number or amount of resources that matters, it's also the allocation of resources in the economy. Um, and if that allocation is bad, and I'll say what I mean by that in a second, um, that, that, that means that they're not being um, employed properly, so that, that causes like a, an output loss or the economy of growth is less and so on. And it's, that, that's what generates the development of poverty. So, what some people think. So I just some of the studies here. Like we'll be happy to see them drop. Also that one. Um, so I want to talk about capital misallocation in particular. Um, and so what misallocation in the simplest possible way means is that uh, basically marginal products are equalized. So there's this idea in economics that um, the efficient allocation of if you have two guys and they have some sort of production function that depends on, say, capital or labor or whatever, um, you should you should distribute the, the resources so that the marginal products are equalized across the two guys. Because like if, if one guy's marginal product were higher, you should give like a, a little bit extra to that guy, um, and then you would raise total production. Pretty obvious. So, so the question is, are uh, marginal products of, of capital equalized, and there's pretty strong evidence that they are. So, in particular, the first, I, so I have two bullet points, and then I'll say how these point to uh, evidence that marginal products aren't equalized. So, the first bullet point is that the, the idea that interest rates provide a lower bound on individual marginal products. So, if you take out capital from a bank or you borrow money to invest into machinery, um, and the bank charges you a 50% interest rate, you better hope that you actually have a return that's higher than 50%, because otherwise you wouldn't do it, right? So that, that's just the idea that um, interest rates are lower bound to um, individual marginal products. Then you look around the developing countries, and you see and, and, and look at what interest rates people are prepared to pay for, for loans for productive purposes, and you see crazy numbers like 50%, 80%, or even like above 100% per year. Um, so that's pretty strong evidence that the, the marginal products of people are actually higher than that. So there's a little bit of an issue here because you might think that if default rates are high, you, you can actually, you're, you're in expectation, you pay much less than this if you're prepared, if you think you're going to default anyway. But these studies here show that actually default is pretty low, and so these are actually, you can think of them as, as lower bonds in individual marginal products. In contrast, there's evidence on aggregate marginal products. So there's a, this concept of an aggregate production function, which I which I'll expand a bit. Um, and those are very different. So if you look at estimates of those, you usually see that they're so this is one recent study that's just called the marginal product of capital, which does that for like, I don't know, all companies in the world or something. But, but, um, and they found that the, margin, the aggregate marginal product is pretty much almost always, always below 10% everywhere. Um, there's another study which does it a bit more carefully for China, for example, and they find that the marginal product of, of capital, the aggregate marginal product of capital is 20% there. What so, why does it make sense to look at aggregate production? Sorry? Why does it make sense? Yeah. So, no, I, did, I, so I didn't say it quite correctly. No, that's exactly a good point. I mean, no, it's it's a bit it's a bit weaker uh, it's a bit, bit weaker assumptions that they make. So I want to do it again. So, I do think that they need like perfect competition in the credit market or something to get these to get these estimates. Yeah. So I'm yeah. There's a little bit of an issue, but I I can I have to look it up exactly how they do it, but. Um, Show you later. I, I forget. Um, but I mean, anyway, if you look at 
interest rates that that you charge across countries, so at which countries fall, for example, um, like the, the government as a whole, they're using quite low, so you can think of those as, as the marginal product of the, of the country. I mean, I'm being a bit imprecise, but we can talk more later. Um, so, okay, given that you actually believe me that this is a good estimate of the aggregate marginal product of capital, um, so how do you reconcile those two? Um, the pretty obvious answer is that if like, the aggregate, like the average sort of, is, is very different from individual ones, that so just means that they can't be equalized like, in, within the country, right? So that's a, and the definition of misallocation, as I just said, is that marginal products aren't equalized, so that means there's misallocation. So there's some more evidence. Um, so this is consistent with direct estimates of marginal products. So this is, again, just saying that they're very high marginal products, and they're also very dispersed. So this paper by Banerjee and Duflo, they look at um, what's called the Direct Lending Program in, in India. And it's just uh, the Indian government just somehow made this fund available to, to firms that they can take out loans for productive purposes. And they find that uh, firms who, who, who do get access to this loan, they increase their profits, they increase their sales, um, and so on. So this is pretty strong evidence that they're uh, credit constraint before. So in particular, they, they have huge returns once they get access to this to this uh, fund. And before they just couldn't realize that because there's some sort of constraint that says they, they that they can't take out the money from the private market. So another evidence is this paper by Yudri, Prasuri and Anagal. Um, they look at the returns that people get from growing pineapples in Ghana. Um, which is also thought about as returns on capital because to farm you need like a tractor and so on. So this is, um, this is also capital. And they also have sometimes a huge returns and also a very big dispersion. So 50 to 250%. So I mean, this kind of continues. This is exactly the same um, with a randomized trial, which I you usually think gets you better identification, right? Um, it's also consistent with uh, firm level data. So there's this very like influential study by C. and Clino, who basically they have a, um, a firm level data set for China, India, and the U.S. and they um, and they sort of estimate a structural version of. So, so they they just assume some sort of production function for each firm, and then they estimate an industry equilibrium and they. Uh, they then say that this equilibrium is very different from, from the one in the US, and they, from that, sort of infer that there uh, are distortions um, across plans. So I'm, again, being a bit hand wavy, but this, so the idea is, is usually that you look at the firm size distribution. So the, this one, actually, I think is pretty, pretty easy to understand. So these guys estimate two distributions. They estimate the distribution of productivities. How exactly they do it is, again, like, not, not straightforward, and they estimate the size uh, distribution. And then they look in the US, what's the correlation between um, productivity and size? And obviously, you kind of expect that big firms are, or more productive firms are bigger, right? Um, in, in the US, that's pretty true. In developing countries, that's much less true. So there, there are a lot of very big firms that are very unproductive. Um, and again, they, they take that as, a, as an indication that their credit constraints and that uh, market products are equalized because big firms who are, who are very unproductive shouldn't be able to survive, and small firms who are very productive should grow instead. All right, so this is like some empirical evidence. 